All right, so that's the first book I've ever written. I've done a few television things over the last few days. People ask fairly predictable questions, uh, which is perfectly right, and you expect that you're going to have to, you know, go through that again. But it, it, I was very pleased that uh, when the ABC books asked me to do it, because I'm 75, so only 10 years' time we're walking around my pyjamas dribbling. So you, you've got to get these things out while you can, you know? I will be, though, I will. Um, and once I started, I couldn't stop. I wrote 140,000 words, and they cut it down to 80,000. My writing is not particularly good, and my spelling is appalling. So the first thing is uh, my assistant, Kirsten, and my daughter, Camilla, had to decipher everything that I'd written before it could be put into a typed form. And then various things had to be taken out. There's a lot of politically incorrect things in there. My age, I'm a man, there's going to be a lot of politically incorrect things that you've got to sort out. And there was a few defamatory things that I'm really disappointed that they had to go, but that's the law, and you can't say, you can't say defamatory things about, about people. I had a bit of a run-in with the Commonwealth Bank. There's a little bit about that. But fun <laughs> well, funny enough, when I wrote the very first, when I wrote the very first uh, draft of it, I'd written nothing about the loss of money. I'd written nothing about getting uh, the Order of Australia. I'd written nothing about prostate cancer. And yet a lot of interviewers want to talk about those kinds of things. So I'll cover them off very briefly. We lost a lot of money um, because I trusted an accountant. I'm not entirely imbecilic, but I gave the accountant the responsibility of uh, signing the checks. I figured this might be a, this might turn into tears. This story, so we'll just start very quickly. We ended up having to go deal with lawyers. We've never dealt with lawyers before. A thousand dollars an hour, lawyers. We'd go to the meeting, the first thing I'd say is, talk fast. <laughs> talk fast. And the other annoying thing is that the two barristers, like our barrister and the other team, they both lived in Mossman. And they worked together on some particular projects. And so I said to them, look, go up to the bloody cheese room at, at the fourth village with a couple of little bits of paper and just have a little chat to one another. You can, you know, we can, we can, we can sort it out that way. You don't need to go to court. You don't need all these documents. And you don't need all of these, you know. We, we even had a mediation by Tony Fitzgerald. It cost a lot of money to have Tony Fitzgerald. It's a total waste of time. I mean, the, the Commonwealth Bank weren't taking it seriously, so I rejected everything they did. So you learn something about the law, you learn you don't want to do that again. Prostate cancer, I was operated on a Friday, I was home on Sunday, I was painting on Wednesday. And I painted the whole series of pictures about the uh, attack on Sydney Harbour by Japanese midget submarines. Very serious subject, very seriously reviewed. And the critics were very fulsome in their praise, which I was very pleased about. I was just slightly annoyed that it's only if you paint some pictures about death that people think, <laughs> she must be good, that's really serious. A bunch of flowers is very serious. A picture of Balmoral Beach is very serious. It just depends how well you do it. Um, I went to school here in Mossman, um, and so did Judy. We both went to Mossman High um, a very long time ago. There were still trams carrying people around. And it was boys on one side and girls on the other. And uh, I didn't want to, I wanted to do art. They didn't teach art to boys, which is slightly annoying because they're very good uh, reputation for, for art now with boys. So I convinced them that I should be able to go to the library and, not like this, but a library and look at books on art, like I was 13. I wanted to find pictures of nude women, basically, <laughs> in the art book on the pretext of you know, doing that. And they said, well, look, you have to give up something. And I said, well, great, I'd like to give up algebra because <laughs> algebra and I never met under any circumstances. Never had any kind of relationship, Albert, Algebra and I. 
And in fact, a couple of years ago, Jean and I were in Kazakhstan, and there's a very big statue to the man who invented algebra. And I could, couldn't stop myself by walking across and kicking it. <laughs> I, felt that, I felt that bad about it. It was a funny school. Girls on one side, boys on the other. And you only saw girls at, I keep calling it half time, but it's not. And it's not interval, it's play lunch. That's the correct terminology, isn't it? So long as I'm in a school, play lunch. Um, so at play lunch time, you could go there and boys on one side, girls on the other, but you could only see parts of girls. And in the foreground, you could see food. Food, parts of girls. Had a profound effect on my life. Uh, the whole thing. So I got a special exemption to leave school to go to East City Tech, to go to art school. I was 14 and a half. So I left art school. I wanted to travel. I wanted to start a business. I started a business uh, called Visual Communication with a mate of mine. Went to school with me. We used to sit together in the back of the classroom me gazing out the window, basically. I was very good at that. Gazing out the window, dreamingly thinking of things. My mate Bob, who was my best man, sat in the middle and did, this is when you're supposed to do technical drawing, did very, very complex of German tank battles. Quite good, but you know, didn't have any relationship to that subject. Anyway, so I got the exemption to leave school. I went to art school. I started, <laughs> This is a bit of a waste of time, but my first job was two weeks. I was offered two weeks. I was offered a job at Smith & Julius. It's a very old traditional art uh, studio. Ro Roland Wakelin uh, worked there, Lloyd Rees worked there. I was there two weeks, they paid me 14 pounds a week, and another guy offered me 28 pounds a week and my own office, and the real clincher, when I was 19, the real clincher, I could paint my office whatever colour I wanted. I painted it purple, it's 1959. But suddenly I was an art director, I was out. I never considered that I would go straight from um, art school to being a painter. I wanted to travel, I liked mass communication, I liked design, I was good at it. I went first of all to Japan because I always thought Australia and Japan would have a very close relationship and I've had a lot of exhibitions in Japan. And the first people who really responded to, we did, to what we did were young Japanese, especially young Japanese girls, because they would see the things when we had, like in the first exhibition I made 12 t-shirts to give to the press, had a simple drawing of Sydney Harbour. And uh, Marion von Adelstein wrote a very nice piece that, you know, you can hang a down on yourself or a down on the wall. There's an integrity to everything he does. I was pleased about that. Anyway, and we're still selling that design, but it was a time of kind of nationalism for Australia. It's the 80s, you know. Suddenly, it's, it's World Series cricket, and it's come on, Aussie, come on. And it was those three uh, swan commercials, one with Ben Le Lexon, one with Greg Norman, and one with me. But Australians were feeling very confident, I think, and strong about themselves, timing. So we opened a little shop. First of all, I had just a, and I always knew I wanted to open my own gallery. It's only like a chef owning a restaurant. I mean, what's the difference? It's, I find it, I think it's a very straightforward thing to do. No one you know, tells you how great the work is. It's on the wall, you either like it or you don't. And I don't want to work for anybody else anyway. So, you know, better for us to have our own gallery. So I had a little gallery in North Sydney. I had a T-shirt on a coat hanger outside and people used to come in and buy them. And I, there was a magazine called Billy Blue that came out at that particular time. And I would, they always wanted to use my work as the cover. Sure, I'll give you the cover, you give me space in the magazine. In other words, I was, I was seeking a wider audience and I was trying to make things that people liked. There's a headline in The Guardian recently. They wrote quite a nice piece. In fact, the piece itself was good. The headline, I'm, I think, misunderstood. The headline, probably not written by the woman who wrote it, probably written by the sub-editor. And it said something like, uh, uh, sell out, uh, one trick wonder, or Australia's most underrated artist. Doesn't matter about the last two, but sell out is not right. Not right. I sold in. I started to do things that were a product, 
Now, the younger generation understands that perfectly now, but an older generation of say art critics in Australia would much prefer you to go up a different kind of track. And that came clear to me once. I was in Canberra, it may be in the early 80s. People are starting to see what I could do. And um, it was a businessman sitting there, a tie and a suit and a briefcase, and he called me over. He said, are you Ken Dunn? I said, yeah. He said, I've always wanted to meet you. I said, thanks very much. He said, you know, I, he said, you know, I know that no one else in the world likes what you do, but I think it's great. <laughs> I thought to myself, no one else in the world, that's a fairly big number. You know? but what about mum and the dog and Judy and the kids? No one else in the world, bugger me. So there's a lot of upside if no one else in the world likes what you can do. I think what he meant was maybe I was even then going about things that w wasn't the normal track that Australian artists do. And that wasn't art that we were doing. That was pieces of design, where you design something for a given audience. And if it works, you do some more. There's a nice girl there with little red glasses, and they're like my glasses. I could draw, like if I was drawing something for you, right? If you were a little Japanese girl, I could draw koalas so cute you would faint by their very cuteness because that's what you needed to do. So a lot of Japanese girls would go back to Japan and they would be buying the stuff that we did, not only just the cute things. Even the other day, people were talking about all the bloody tea towels. We've only ever done tea towels. What happened is that once we started to do things, we were knocked off shamelessly. And once people saw things that are bits of bright color, everybody was doing those kinds of things. It was slightly annoying but you can't turn around and say, we didn't do that. I'll give you an example of it. John Coates. John Coates ran the Olympic Games. Now, Camilla and I did the program for the opening and closing ceremony of the, of the Olympic Games, the booklets themselves. But John Coates, in a talk the other day, I was in the audience, he, he, he recognised me, he acknowledged me, which was very nice, and he said, oh, let's get down. Did the uh, uniforms for the volunteers at the Olympic Games? No. I didn't do it at all. They weren't, that, they weren't bad, but they weren't that good. If you work with a lot of colour, it's quite complicated to put it together. It's like working with a big jazz band. But everything that was seemingly bright, we copped it. Uh, I, I, I don't move away from that. I, that, that's fine. Probably the one that I remember most is that somebody gave me a T-shirt that was line for line drawing of uh, the Sydney Harbour drawing that I'd done. Every colour correct, every line correct. The thing that gave it away is underneath where I'd written Sydney Harbour, these people had written Gulf of Thailand. <laughs> now, surely that's a clue, isn't it? That's a, that's a clue that somehow it might not be the right thing. But you accept that. Like in America, when we had licensing arrangements and people were knocking us off shamelessly there, like you get out of the, you could go to the airport in LA and the, all of those tourist shops would all be car carrying knockoffs of our, st of our stuff. But at the American licensee, you can sue those people. They have to give you the money that you would have got had they been your designs, and they have to destroy the rest of the things. In Australia, it's much more complicated. I've never done anything. I've never done anything about it. Uh, but in America. I did a lot of things in America, like I did, I did the design for Koala Blue, the logo for Koala Blue, because Olivia came here, saw the shop, liked it, wanted to open Koala Blue. I said, sure, I'll do it, because she was really promoting Australian design. And we used to send little notes back and forth, and their shop was open, it was really quite good. And then they said, well, you know, we want to use some of your drawings on lots of other things. And I said, well, now you have to, it's business. It has to be a licensing arrangement now. And instead of getting a little handwritten note back from Olivia, I got this note with all the lawyers' names down one side, basically saying, look, I won't use the words, but basically saying, look, we're not interested. You gave it to her, that's it. So I was annoyed about that, but I didn't want the complication, so I gave it to her. About three weeks later, a guy called me up. He said, that Ken Dunn, I said, yeah. He said, look, my name is Bart Jacobs. I've got a shop in Malibu. 
Uh, he said, I've seen the work you've done for Koala Blue. He said, I want you to do some work for me. He said, uh, do you do bunnies? Bunnies are very big in California. Well, I don't really do bunnies. Anyway, I sent him over a couple of koala drawings with slightly longer ears, basically. <laughs> anyway, he came back to me and said, mate, they're walking. He didn't say mate, he said, my God, he said, they're walking out the door. They love them. <laughs> so then he said, look, what about Scotty dogs? Do you do Scotty dogs? <laughs> well, I said, I don't do Scotty dogs. I said, if you want to talk, you better come to Australia. Anyway, he came to Australia. We started a business relationship. He's a nice bloke. We, we were in, I, I did work for him and his company for a long time, which meant all down that Californian coast, you know, Santa Barbara, Santa Monica, things like that. We had shops under license. We had designs going. I was even, they, I, I, they, I went to Disney, you know, I went to Disney. They wanted me to look at the Disney characters to see whether I'd do something with them. Well, I didn't want to do it, basically. But it was quite interesting to go there. You go down, Dopey, they say, go down Dopey Drive, turn at, at Cinderella Place, and then <coughs> down past the Three Pigs, and then you'll get to the design department. And it's just a bizarre, it's a total different world. Anyway, I didn't want to do it. Um, so after I'd done all the Californian things, then they wanted me to do... Because you can write an alphabet. You can write a Californian alphabet so that you can write all kinds of words and they look vaguely Californian. It's a piece of design. That's not art. It's a piece of design. And then they wanted me to do Midwestern mid cities. I'm an appalling speller. I spent such a long time looking at Albuquerque. I could never get it right. You know, it's such a complicated word. And I thought, fuck it, Albuquerque, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and so that sort of came to the conclusion too. So we've had big licensing rooms in America. We had all the windows in Bloomingdale's at one stage. We, we, we had... We had things in Macy's. We, we did a lot of things, but it was always under license. So it wasn't precisely the way that we would do it. They might interpret things a little bit. And that came to a head once in Japan. I was in a t I'd been to the airport. We had a good licensing arrangement. I was, on, I was on the way to meet the president of this particular company. And I saw it was a big shop, my name there, and full of stuff, full of stuff that we hadn't really done. Stuff that might have been vaguely <coughs> about the feeling, but not us, you know? People would ring up from other countries and they'd say, like from Chicago, Brown is very big in Chicago. What are you doing in Brown? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing in Brown. I'm not thinking Brown. I'm a bloody Balmoral <laughs> swimming. <laughs> so those licensing arrangements always come down to, do you trust the people and do you want to do it? And if those two things are right, you continue to do it. So we had licensing arrangement in Japan for about five years, America for maybe seven years. The one shop that we had became 15 shops. And it was good. But if you have 15 shops, we even had a shop here, you know, we had a little shop there. If you have 15 shops, you need to have 50 shops. That's the next move. And then you need to have store managers and you need to have international meetings with people and uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that. All of it was distracting for me for the painting and I would be spending much less time designing things than I would be painting but of course the design thing was the thing that you were all seeing. Uh, you know we had design for, for Sheraton or for uh, Oriton. So companies like that would put the work everywhere, but it was only a small part of the output that I was doing. And you cop a bit of criticism on the way. I use, as I already told you, the Canberra man, uh, I use as an example, there was somebody who took the trouble to ring up an Eastern Suburbs newspaper and wrote that in his opinion, Ken Doan does not have a scintilla of ability. Now, I've not been to university, but I understand that scintilla, tiny. <laughs> I've got more than a scintilla. And at the other extreme, there's a very nice lady in Canberra who continues to write to us, and she wrote a piece to say if she took Van Gogh and Monet and, and David Hockney and all of those people, and if you put them all together, 
that I was 10 times better than all of those people. Now, in defence of that lady, she's actually just gone into a home <laughs> in Canberra, so she's not, she's not, you know, she's not. Anyway, I, 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 I'm very pleased that she should feel those things. But in between, it's kind of up to people. What you feel about a painting is up, is up to you. It's not, you can't add it up. It's what you feel. There's two big paintings up here in the front door just uh, that I hadn't seen for a while that I really think they're all right. A painting is that you just don't know where it's going to end. You start off with some kind of idea, but then it has a track of its own. And it's very hard. It's only up to what other people think about it. Like I spoke recently. So I'm not against installations, but I'm a painter. Not, not even artists. An artist is a very misused word. Kids come out of, come out of uh, art school, they come and see me and say, oh, I've been to art college, now I'm an artist. Well, probably not. I think you've probably got to go and paint 500 paintings and then, and then talk about it. It's a strange journey because you spend it on your own, you set the project yourself, um, and it certainly led us to some amazing situations and all I ever wanted to be judged by was what I was trying to do. If I was trying to do swimwear, was a good swimwear. If I'm trying to do paintings, was it a good was it a good painting? But everybody has different ideas about things. But you do have to accept it's what other people think about things. It's what they think about it. And it's like painting. It shouldn't give you everything on the first view. It should give you pleasure over time. And in a time when we are bombarded by horrific things on television every night while you're sitting there watching, watching the news, painting should be more about pleasure, I think. More like poetry. Give you pleasure over time. Maybe you only see it out of the corner of your eye when you're walking through a room. And if there are pictures that you don't look at, get new pictures, you know? It's such a personal thing. And I often find pictures that have more love and more honesty in sometimes little country shows. Or I once went to the Royal Easter Show and I found this picture of a woman called Fran Gardner. She's dead now. Uh, better than Grandma Moses. Lived in the upper reaches of the Hunter Valley. And I collected a lot of her pictures. And they were just little naive pictures of the little house she lived in and her husband on the, on the front porch with one of those little metal things where you fixed up your shoes and every bloody pansy was painted. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful. You don't need a wall text to tell you that's good. If you like that kind of thing, it's good. And you can use, well, I mean, there are a lot of people, you can't use the word pretty or beautiful in the Museum of Contemporary Art, they ask you to move, you know, they, 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 have, they have you thrown out, so I don't have anything like that. I think that's too narrow, I think that's too narrow in the time in which we live. Creative process, I used to have it, I still have it I suppose, although I hope it doesn't happen now. I used to say to the kids when they first got into the business, look, here's the thing, it's called the Brazil option, the Brazil option. And what I mean by that is if you wake up in the morning and you think, I'd really like to go to Brazil, go to Brazil. Go to Brazil. You have to love it. It's a great privilege to be a painter. I don't take it lightly at all. It's, uh, it's, I've never sought a government grant. I don't want anything from anybody. But, so I wanted to see whether I could support us by that. Now, <laughs> they're supporting us now. Um, the, the painters die halfway through their life. In other words, there's never enough time to paint all the paintings that you'd like to paint. And there's never enough time to get better at it. That's the drive. The drive is wanting to get better at it. This guy that interviewed me today, it, it, I often ask this question, you know, what's your favourite painting? And I always say it's the next one. And I'd always been, I'd described it the day, the guy that, you know, Saturday was a fantastic day. Saturday was really a beautiful day. Sunday was a very beautiful day. It was very grey and very soft. And I was walking along Chinaman's Beach in the morning and the sky and the sea were almost the same colour. You could hardly see the horizon. 
just two kinds of greys. One a slightly greeny grey, one a slightly yellow grey. And there were three people on kayaks going out towards Mort Middlehead. And there were two, one, two, three yellow boys in the marker, in the water. And the edge of the sand was a sort of strange mauve colour. There's the picture. I don't need, that's in my head. And that's probably, the next series of pictures I'm, I'm doing are uh, essentially about where we live and those kinds of things. And that's enough information for me. I don't want to do it photographically. I want to see whether I can make a painting that, that has that essential feeling about it. Yes. Um, which, if any, artists inspired you in the beginning and now? Okay. The first art book I ever bought, bought it from Angus and Robertson's, had a yellow cover and it was about Van Gogh. And Van Gogh's a very obvious one to start off with because of the quality of the paint and the whole story about him and the kind of, you know, the flowers and the look that he did. So then you move from Van Gogh and then you go through Monet and then you go through Matisse and then you go through American Abstractionist and I like, there's a painter, American painter called Milton Avery that I like very much, a very simple painter. Uh, very beautiful things. So I like, I like everything from Dutch still lifes to naive pictures of the Easter show. It's a matter of whether you use your eyes or what you like. But art doesn't drop out of the sky and hit one person on the head. So you learn from every single thing that you've seen. And there's no point, well there is a point, but you can't spend a lot of time talking about painting pontificating about painting, actually have to do painting. For any of you who paint, I, I, I have only two things to say. Work faster and bigger brushes. Don't bugger around. No little bloody fiddly bits. <coughs> faster, bigger brushes. But in saying that, it almost sounds like I know what I'm talking about, which is not true because you might want to do little small fiddly things, which is perfectly all right. But I think if you can remember, look, every single person in this room are and were, or were artists. You could paint and draw before you could walk. It was the easiest thing to do. There was a thing in The Guardian the other day, some guy's very critical, critical of my work, saying it's not as good as kindergarten work. Of course it's not as good as <laughs> kindergarten work. I'm not as good as a bloody five-year-old. I mean, I went, I had a big exhibition in Mwollomba a couple of years ago, all of the big reef paintings, as good as I could make them, good pictures. And in every gallery that you have, there's always a book where people write comments. You want to read them but you can't be seen to be rushing over there while everybody's watching you to read them. So you have to wait till there's no one else in the gallery. So I went across when there was no one else in the gallery and you quickly, you know, flick through them all and you see, oh yeah, terrific, great group. And you see all these really wonderful ones and you, and you think, your ego says, well, of course, people with a bit of taste and style. But the things that you remember, the less complimentary one, and there's a terrific one there, from a 10-year-old girl in Mwollomba, and she had written, really, Ken, I can do better paintings and I'm still in primary school. Next time, try harder. <laughs> it's a really good comment, isn't it? It's a really good comment because, of course I can't do paintings better than kids in primary school. And yes, I will try harder next year or next time. In fact, the, it's the Tweed Regional Gallery and they want to have another exhibition. I said, only if you call it Ken Dan Trying Harder. <laughs> so there's always, there's always space to go. Yes? Um, Ken, did you grow up in a house that was all creative? Like, that was such a young age that you wanted to be an artist? I grew up in a little country town called McLean. And just after the war, my father, I didn't see my father until he was five, like a lot of, like I was born in 1940, when the war started. I hope it wasn't something I said, but anyway, the war went on for five years, my dad came home, I didn't know quite what to expect. Anyway, we moved to McLean, I'm an only child, so I spent a lot of time in my head, and I, my mother, well, all parents are 
congratulatory to their kids but my mother really liked what i did you know and she had a subscription to the saturday evening post the woman's weekly was in sepia in those days it's in brown and white there were no color magazines in australia so suddenly the saturday evening post arrived i used to love to look at look at the color of the magazines but also i used to love to look at the flowers and when the clarence river is flooding it's this wonderful khaki color with bits of bright green hyacinth and kind of ultramarine blue flowers i like looking at those kinds of things so the short answer is there are no artists in our family i can't remember a, a painting on the wall and even in my grandparents house in uh, belmore i think there were a couple of vague sort of egyptian scenes but no no painters my uncle hubert who was a great sign writer and once took me to, he was doing a sign on the outside of a fish shop in hurstville a beautiful painting of two big prawns two big prawns he could have been bloody you know forget jeff coons the pup my uncle hubert could have been a bloody prawn king painter of the world but it was the war and it was tough short answer is i was encouraged to do it i like doing it more than anything else and i wasn't too good at many other things i have a report card or a number of cards where it's a bit embarrassing this but you're from mossman i can tell you <laughs> the uh one teacher had written ken is the most inventive student we've ever had thank you very much a couple of lines further down another teacher had written if i ever had a son i would like him to be like ken thank you in between another teacher had written this boy is a fool <laughs> so it's a pretty succinct use of the english language isn't it? and i think it shows you you can't win them all you cannot win them all some people can like me there some people think you're a fool oh, at the end well Thank you, brother.